I have a couple of things to say before you guys start. Okay, so we have a presentation today. We'll start with the presentation before I continue with uh, hopefully finishing up enzyme and starting with the daily protein. I'm a little bit behind here. But I just want to remind those of you uh, that have not contacted me yet for a meeting prior to your presentation. Um, I still want to meet with you to finalize your uh, papers. I don't recall if everybody finalized their two papers that they presented me, and but in your case, I'm not familiar. And then also uh, looking at the draft. For instance, next week I would want to make sure that um, I see a draft by end of this week. So you will put something in my calendar, Sim and Rachel so that you have time to revise before your presentation next week. I thought we were the 17th. Huh? We're the 17th of April. Oh, that's my idea. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. That's me. Okay, and I already yeah. see the draft. You're good. Sorry that I scared you both. <laughs> no, then like by end of down. next week. By end of next week. Okay? Just make sure you put something in there. Okay. Phew, we're ready for you to Okay, and then we have a, a presentation form. Just make sure you look over it before they start presenting so that you know what you're looking for in terms of evaluation. You don't have to write your name down here unless you are a presenter. The way it goes, 25% um, weight will go to the class evaluation. 25% weight will go to your evaluation of yourself, and then 50% will go to weight uh, of the score. Okay? Um, I guess that's all. And yeah, I think this is all. So, what we'll do is uh, Becky and Nina will present, and for 20 around. 18, 16 to 20 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions. They are evaluated for questions, so please prepare for questions, and also it will become a tour of your participation. Okay, you have the floor. Okay. okay. So I'm Becky May, this is Nina Lee. We are presenting on polyphenol oxidase, um, looking at the effects of blanching on it, and also a new method to quantify. So quick outline, we're going to start with some background on the enzyme itself, then we'll move into the first article, which is discussing the blanching of sliced potatoes on the PPO activity. Then we'll move into the second article, which is a new method of PPO activity detection using SARES, and finally we'll have a summary of both. Um, so the quick background, so polyphenol oxidase, it's found in plants, fungi, insects, animals, um, it's responsible for enzymatic browning, and sometimes that's desirable, such as in tea, coffee, but sometimes it's undesirable, such as in fruit and veggies. Um, and so there's a family of the enzymes, and some examples include monophenol oxidase, diphenol oxidoreductase, and lacase. Um, and the enzyme works by catalyzing oxidation reaction of phenols to the corresponding quinones. Um, and so it's really important for this reaction to occur that it's in the pre presence of oxygen in the enzyme. And so we'll go from a monophenol to a diphenol, which is colorless. It then will react to become a quinone, which is colored. It then can react with amino acid proteins to form complex brown polymers known as melanins. Um, and so we see the example from the white potato to the brown. So this is really important because over 50% of produce loss is from enzymatic browning. Um, and so understanding the kinetics of the um, enzyme can really minimize loss production, improve the quality of the final product, and improve yield and margin, which is important to companies. So our first paper is really more focusing on how can we optimize the processing to minimize this enzyme. While the second paper is really more of how can we quantify, these are both really important for um, uh, quality maintenance for industry. So our first paper is on the effects of hot water and steam blanching of sliced potatoes on polyphenol oxidase activity. 
So the justification behind this paper is that potatoes are widely consumed worldwide. They're actually the fourth most important food sector. Um, and so processing also really impacts the quality of potatoes. Color and appearance are the key quality aspects in potatoes, especially in cut potatoes. And so enzymatic browning is a really common consumer complaint. Um, blanching does in inactivate the enzyme, but it will decrease the quality through bleaching, which is making the potatoes white versus that nice yellow color. Um, and anti-browning is widely studied, but right now there's not a lot on the ther thermal inactivation kinetics of the enzyme. Um, and so really the objective is to determine how to optimize potato blanching based on polyphenol oxidase kinetics and unfold the enzyme while minimizing bleaching. Um, so, potatoes in this study were either steam or hot water blanched at varying times and temperatures. Um, the inactivation kinetics were evaluated to determine the optimum treatment. This was looking at inactivation kinetics, substrate specificity, and transition state parameters. And they also wanted to understand the impacts of the treatments on colors. So this method, they started out with potatoes, sliced them, and cleaned them in chlorinated water. The potatoes were then blanched in either steam or hot water at 80 or 90 C. And for up to 10 minutes, the time was determined on how long it took to inactivate 90% of the enzyme. The enzyme was then extracted using a chilled phosphate buffered saline solution, and activity was measured. Um, we also measured color, so looking at the yellow whiteness of the potato, thermal inactivation kinetics, substrate specificity, and transit transition state parameters. Um, so the substrate in the, to measure the enzyme activity was catechol, and it was measured on UV vis scanning spectrophotometer at 420 nanometers for two minutes. Uh, we determined a lot of things, well, they determined a lot of things out of this study. We'll go over some of them in more detail as we look at the results. So a lot of results, kind of busy, but we'll break it down. So first, we'll look at the left column. This is K which is the affinity of an enzyme for the substrate. So if you look at the second row, you'll see that 90C hot water blanching had the highest K value, which means it has the lowest affinity. You'll also see if you compare temperatures that 80C had the higher affinity, and the steam had a higher affinity for the substrate than the hot water. Um, moving on, T one half is the half time. So this or the half-life, it's the time for the enzyme activity to be reduced by 50%. Um, so all of the tests except for the steam at ADC were able to reach their half-life in less than a minute. Um, and next up is the D value, which is the decimal reduction time or the treatment time required to reduce enzymatic activity to 10%. Um, so the lower D value will inactivate faster. We're kind of seeing a trend here that the water at 90C it's going to be inactivating faster, and this um, steam at, or sorry, water at 90 is fastest, steam at 80 is going to be inactivating slowest. Um, so moving on to the line weaver burke plot, on the left, um, so control is the blue line, our test is hot water at 90C is the red line. Um, we'll see that there's a lower Km value on the red line compared to the blue. And so this is showing a loss of affinity for the substrate. And then also there's a smaller VM, which is a steeper line. Um, and this means there's lower activity of the enzyme for the substrate. On the right, we have that the Vmax is positively related to the enzyme concentration. And it's significantly dropped after the heating process. Um, and so the inactivated part of the enzyme, we can tell that, and also it changed the kinetic efficiency of the enzyme after heating. And so really the major findings was that faster inactivation occurred at higher temperatures, hot water blanching is faster than steam blanching, and this is most likely due to the direct contact of the hot water compared to the steam. Um, PPO had less affinity for the substrate when it was heated with hot water blanching compared to the steam. And the inactivation kinetics are very heat dependent. Um, one thing that we didn't go over in the results, but is important that they found is that steam blanching at 90 C resulted in the most bleaching of the potato. Um, and so all of the treatments can inactivate polyphenol oxidase to less than 10% of the original activity in less than five minutes. 
With that said, hot water blanching is faster than steam blanching, and it requires less energy to unfold the enzyme. Um, all treatments did result in bleaching, but it was more pronounced in the hot water bleaching, and so the hot water and 90 c while it inactivated best, it did have the most bleaching. So if an industry person were to read this paper, they really could come to the conclusion that maybe they'd find a balance between these results. Maybe hot water ADC to decrease the bleaching while still getting the inactivation. Um, so now that we kind of know a little bit about inactivating the enzyme, let's move on to how do we quantify it. Okay, so the second article we're going to look at is the new method for accurate determination of polyphenol oxidase activity based on reduction of SIRS intensity of catechol. So first I want to go over the justification. And so they mentioned three different methods. Um, and then lastly, they explained why they were looking at SIRS instead of the two methods that I mentioned on top. So the color metric assay, it's fast, but it is not reliable. So it's the most common and the most simple method that is used in industry, but it is not sensitive. And they also mentioned that there were interferences with the um, secondary product. Um, so um, we don't want that. That's not reliable. Um, and then we have biosensor based assays where it is not very fast, but it is reliable. So they said that it was accurate and sensitive, but it was also complex and tedious, and it's also time consuming. And so this is why they were looking at Raman spectroscopy, especially um, SIRS, so surface enhanced Raman, sur Raman spectroscopy. Um, and they also, they called it scattering. Um, so that's the S that was replaced with scattering that they called it. And so that was fast and reliable. So it's sensitive, you have the enhanced signal from the surface, and then it's also low limit of detection. So we don't need as much of a sample for this assay, or for this method. So going over um, what the study was about, it was the first study that they claimed to be using SIRS to determine the PPO activity in fruits and vegetables. Um, it was based on the detection of catechol in the reaction medium, and so I'll go over that principle in a little bit. Um, and then they also were looking at the linear relationship in the reduction of the SIRS intensity and the PPO activity. So the objective for the study, they wanted to develop a surface-enhanced Raman scattering approach for accurate determination of the PPO activity in fruits and vegetables. So here are the principles that I want to just outline in the study. And so the first one is that the new SIRS method is based on the enzymatic reaction, which is what the whole presentation is about. Um, and so we have catechol, and then in the presence of oxygen and polyphenol oxidase, it will um, convert over to a quinone. And so we want to really focus on the catechol in this method. Um, and so just remember that throughout the um, results section. Um, and then just a really high level understanding of the principle of SIRS. And so um, I just want to introduce that the phenyl um, hydroxyl groups in the catechol is what promotes the adhesion to the silver surface, is what, is what they used in the SIRS. Um, method and so with that um, promotion of adhesion we get which would generate a resonance coupling and then it will give you the enhanced Raman signal um, and then I just want to see say that the SERS intensity was related to the concentration of the catechol in the medium which is really important in this study is that we remember that more polyphenol oxidase activity you're going to get less catechol which is measured in the SERS method and so that's why it's what they were mentioning, a reduction of the SIRS intensity. And so this is really busy about the experimental design. They broke it down stepwise, but I just want to really focus on the different colors that I um, broke it up into. And so they, um, they created their own catechol solution by diluting the different um, solutions down to get different concentrations and determine the standard from that. And that's what they measured in the SIRS. They also did the same thing, similar things, to get the concentration of the PPL solution. Um, and then they also measured the apples and potatoes and see the, um, the effects of the PPL activity with the, the determination of the SIRS. And so um, I also want to mention that they compared the food samples of apples and potatoes 
um, with the calorimetric assay later in the methods. Um, and then finally, they mentioned that they did a silver nanoparticle synthesis, and they did TEM, and then UV spectro spectrophotometer. Um, and that part, they just wanted to show that there was reproducibility, and then that the nanoparticles, the silver nanoparticles, were stable with the, the two methods. So the experimental conditions, um, just to clearly outline what they were doing, they were looking at just the Raman spectrum of the catechol solution, in which then they compared it with the SIRS spectrum of catechol solution, and in addition with the silver nanoparticles. They did the same thing later on and added the polyphenol oxidase solution, and then finally they used the real food samples um, to see the reliability of this method. So in the results, they broke it down into five different sections, and so I'm just going to skip straight to two, which I found was the most important um, part of the study. And so um, looking at the surface activity of catechol with the silver nanoparticles, um, they said that there was no signal of the catechol solution using ramen, um, and then there was a signal that was magnified um, when the catechol solution was mixed with the silver nanoparticles. And then there were many characteristic bonds that occurred in the SIRS spectrum, which I'll show later. And then there was also a weaker SIRS intensity found when they added the PPO addition. So this figure right here I found was the most important major finding um, in the study. And so I just want to point out right here, this is the Raman, Raman signal with the catechol. And so they called it no signal, but it's just a very, very weak signal that you see that black line right there. Um, and then, so they added the silver nanoparticles. They saw there was a little bit of enhancement, and so that's that pink line, but it's still very weak. And so this is why they were trying to use SIRS with the um, catechol and the silver nanoparticles. And you see there was a huge magnification of the um, signal of catechol right there is that red line right on top. And so you can see a huge difference from black to red. And then finally, I just want to point out um, with the PPO addition, you see that reduction from that red line to that purplish line. And so that's what they're going to call the reduction in the signal. Um, and then they also finally pointed out that there were many characteristic bands in the signal. And so this um, 1258 is a characteristic of the carbon to oxygen bond um, frequency um, with the catechol. And so you would not see this with the quinones um, if there was a reduction. So now going on to the catechol concentration. And so they found that below one um, millimolar and above nine millimolar that the SIR signal was too weak. And so that's how they found the optimum concentration range for this method to be between one and nine millimolars. Um, and then that's how they determined that there was a linear relationship to the concentration of the catechol solution. So that's the standard that we see on the side right there. Um, and that's what helped them determine the starting concentration of the catechol for um, polyphenol oxidase activity to be nine millimolars. Um, and so this right here, I just wanted to point out the two figures. Um, they showed that there was a reduction when they added the PPO um, activity. So you see this difference in the area right here. This is what they pointed out to be characteristic of the catechol solution. And so um, delta I is what they call the reduction in surface intensity of the catechol in the linear response area, so this area right here. And then they took that over the time interval in minutes um, of the linear response area. Um, and this right here, they're measuring the concentration. Um, they started from 500 to, five, to, to 50,000 um, units of activity per liter of the polyphenol oxidase activity. And you see that there's like the linear relationship with the concentration. And then finally, looking at the real um, food sample, so they used apples and potatoes in this um, experiment or in this study. And they, the apples range from um, 3,000 to 300 units of activity per liter. 
and then potatoes were 7,500 to 600 respectively. Um, and so that's how they determined that the standard is going to range from 500 to 50,000. Um, and then just a quick, they did a um, recovery experiment using the apples and potatoes to confirm the feasibility of this method. So they used the SERS method and compared it to the color metric assay um, and then discovered that there was a 70 to 100 percent um, recovery range, which indicated that the new SERS method is accurate and reliable. So to conclude, they were successful um, in using SERS for polyphenol oxidase activity determination. Um, it is suitable to detect low polyphenol oxidase activity in food samples, and it is a fast tool to detect polyphenol oxidase in, food, in the food industry. So they said it could be used to improve product quality and the optimization of processing technologies. And so now I'm just going to go straight into the summary um, and compare the two um, articles. So the first article, again, it was a thermal inactivation of polyphenol oxidase um, enzymes in potatoes. And so the method could be readily applied for other food samples. Um, and they showed that hot, hot water blanching was best to inactivate polyphenol oxidase. And then also the wat hotter, wat, hot water blanching results in the most bleaching. However, they were unable to maximize the inactivation while minimizing the bleaching. Um, and also, this method, they didn't look into the um, sensory aspect or the shelf life of what could happen to potatoes after this process. And so that would be really interesting to look into after this, um, this study. And then the second article, again, we're looking at the new method of polyphenol oxidase determination using SIRS. And so they need to further do some further testing using food samples that have been treated for quality maintenance. And so they were using um, apples and potatoes that weren't treated for quality that you would see in um, processing at all. And so maybe looking at apples and potatoes that were treated with sulfates or even blanching to see if there was any maybe interferences with the SIRS um, signals. Um, and then although it is fast and accurate, the technology is expensive. So Maybe it's not feasible for small production facilities. And then finally, to ensure the proper training of employees, it needs to be implemented in the production facility to make sure that we get proper reading of the SERS method. And that's all we have. Any questions? Mm -hmm. All right, questions? Yeah. yeah. So they're originally kind of yellowish, and so the bleaching is it moving more to tr a true white. Okay. So they did like a color test. Yeah, they used like, a colorimeter. Yeah, to determine that. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah. Why do you think the hot water works better than the steam? I think it was the direct contact of the hot water versus the steam. There's air that also could reduce the um, energy transfer. Yeah, they mentioned that it used a lot more energy to get that steam going mm -hmm. and to um, inactivate the polyphenol oxidase. Yeah. Yeah. One more follow-up. Yeah. Just sometimes in mills, they uh, take it to 121 degrees for five seconds. Do you think that would be Useful here, or would that work for um, So it's definitely a possibility. The higher temp, shorter time, mm -hmm. I think, like we've seen in milk, can be really good from a quality perspective. Mm -hmm. um, these temperatures and times were chosen based on previous studies that have been successful. Um, and so I think it's kind of what is the temperature that we can't, ADC is kind of the threshold of if you go below that, it's going to take a long time to inactivate. So they're kind of trying to hang out in that time frame. For the second paper, the one phenol oxidase and the one which is used for the standard curve was from mushroom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I was just wondering if that would affect the analysis of this result since we are comparing it with the sources that the US Yeah, I was wondering that too. I, they didn't really mention like the differences in the two, so um, 
I don't know if anybody caught, but they use polyphenol any standard from mushrooms, and that's what they used um, to spike the food samples. And so I'm wondering if there was any differences as well, but they never mentioned it. Yeah, that's but good. They were looking at chemical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So and both enzyme sources will potentially decrease the chemical content. Mm -hmm. And they were just looking at chemical. They were not really detecting enzyme activity. Yeah. Yeah. They only used the food samples in the very end of the study, and so most of the study was the chemical. Okay. Yeah. What are some like um, manufacturing uses for the sliced potato and deactivated polyphenol oxidase? Because when do you sell like raw sliced potato? Is, is, is it already browning problem when it's already cooked and you turn it into potato chips? Or what so I think it would be more like, unfortunately, let's say we're making a chip, we slice it. We're not, we may not instantly fry. Maybe there's another step in between. Um, or maybe if you're mashing it, there's other steps while the mashing is occurring before you get to the drying step. And so really it's during that time, like we've all seen apples and potatoes brown pretty quickly. And so the t being able to inactivate before you mash and, or even after you mash, and so before you actually dry, you don't have all that browning occurring. And then I would also think they probably use it like in restaurants and stuff, so pre-cut potatoes before they fry them up. Mm -hmm. Or in retail, in sense, it would be like apples that are pre-sliced and packaged. Yeah. But would you put apples in water? So in this case, no, but you could for like applesauce. Yeah. Yeah? Um, Now, oh, yeah. yeah you, you said that below one minute about the signal was too weak. Actually, mm -hmm. in the paper, it's not say the signal is too weak. It's because of the increased rate of intensity is low. That means it's actually we increase the concentration. The signal is high, but it's not increased that fast, so it cannot be used in the standard curve. So the Oh, the change in intensity. Yeah, the change in intensity. Not the intensity. Yeah, so. not the okay. intensity. Gotcha. Because yeah. the more of the concentration, you you get the more intensity. Okay. So it's not too weak. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have a question. And I think, Becky, when you were talking about K values, can you go back to that yep. table? I'm wondering if you really meant to say affinity or because k value is your rate constant. Okay. So it's not your km. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So by by knowing that it's the rate constant, can you tell me again your conclusion here? Um. So in that case, then if k is the rate constant, the higher value then the inactivation would occur quicker? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Does, it, does your conclusion <laughs> remain correct? Your yeah. Overall, overall conclusion, yeah. Remains correct. Okay. Um, and then for the using Sears, can you go back to showing your spectra again? Yep. You know? This one? Okay, yeah, this, yeah. Uh, right. Go only to the same thing oh. right now. Uh, okay. Here. Yep. So, what do you think their purpose is by checking without a substrate, just putting the nanoparticles? They, they did add the substrate to this one, but they were using just Brahmin instead of these SIRS. SIRS yeah. is basically surface enhanced, and the surface enhanced is by using the nanoparticles. Okay. That's the definition of okay. surface, right? Because surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy is basically using uh, the silver nanoparticles as a surf ruffled surface that wants to put the catechol on, then you enhance. Okay, yep, yep, I probably just misunderstood that part. Yeah, so it is just the, um, just, just, just the, the silver nanoparticles. Yeah, just yeah. to show maybe 
kind of as their native control. There mm -hmm. is nothing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's all. Okay. Saying. So that mm -hmm. is one thing I wanted to point out. And then, do you think um, if they had done a queen on standard, it would be a good idea? I think so. Yeah. But I think um, just to make this method more clear, I think it would have just like confused all the results. I think they were just trying to demonstrate that there was a reduction in that um, characteristic band with yeah, just the catalog. Do, how would they know that this characteristic band is not also present in Elon? They, they were, they mentioned it multiple, uh, it different is, characteristics. I just kind of like I'm didn't include them. Yeah. This would have been nice to run Let's the product. Yeah. So they, they mentioned that like there are different um, signals that were characteristic of catechol only. Yeah. And so they, let's see. Yeah, I, I guess my question is how did they know that it's characteristic of catechol and not a queen as well? Mm -hmm. um, I want to say that right there, it was just that one band to, from carbon to oxygen. That that's right there. Yeah. Today. Yep. And that's what they distinguished. I can't find right here. But I think that's what I remember reading. Yeah. Well, I guess is if you want to critique them, I would say it would have been much more more confirmatory if they did if they did the, the quinone. Yeah. 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 Yes. So that's not a critique. It was a critique. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good. All right, we are still on the subject of PPO. And that was the last slide we talked about um, methods to inhibit or inactivate. And heat inactivation was one. And this today's presentation demonstrated the impact of heating on PPO activity. But there are other um, ways to inactivate agent, chelating agent, adjusting the pH, removing the water, genetic engineering, modified atmospheric packaging, inhibitors, and others. So I have two case studies for you as well uh, today. Uh, one of them looked at uh, predicting the behavior of PPO enzymes in two varieties of peaches. And with that, this can help determine the best variety for each processing application. So looking at the activity of these enzymes in two different varieties will probably help in determining which variety will be suited for what application. That was kind of the intent. So they did enzyme kinetics. They looked at substrate specificity. Um, and then they looked at the use of different inhibitors and the, the impact of different inhibitors of the two different enzymes. So here's what they found. They obviously uh, done the uh, enzyme kinetics and plotted the line Riverberg plot over here. And from there, they got the uh, Km and Vmax value. And then from there, they got the catalytic efficiency. Um, and then they ran it with different substrates, obviously, and they determined the Vmax and the Km and the catalytic efficiency. And if you see here, this methyl catechol, for example, was the most um, specific, or the enzyme was most specific to methyl catechol 
and uh, the variety SU was more specific to that, whereas the variety SE was more specific to another substrate. How did they determine that? If you look at the KM, so they have the lowest KM here among those three substrates, and lowest KM indicates highest affinity. And But you will see here that Vmax is lowest for for this substrate compared to the other two, and you go, how come was this the best substrate? Because if you look at the catalytic efficiency, which takes into account not only Vmax alone or Km alone, but the ratio, and then since the Km is so low, this value became the highest. So the catalytic efficiency is very important kind of final uh, value that you need to look at, uh, look at, not only the Km, not only the Vmax, because they could be opposite. So this is the lowest here, and this is the lowest, the Vmax is lowest. So you would think that, okay, now these are opposite to everything else, but by looking at Vmax or Km, you get the catalytic efficiency, and kind of that's your final answer there. Um, also here, Km is the lowest for uh, pyrogalol. Uh, however, the Vmax is the lowest too. But again, looking at Vmax over Km, you get the highest value, and that would be your determining factor for enzyme specificity to the different substrates. So looking at different inhibitors, um, just a reminder here, when the Vmax does not change, or when you have the same intercept or similar intercept, and the Km is changing, this is competitive inhibition. And then they looked at uh, the different types of inhibitors, and they determined that the benzaldehyde was the most inhibiting for uh, both enzymes. So it had the highest slope, and with the highest slope, that means it has the highest Km value because the slope is Km over Vmax. Since Vmax would be similar, then the Km was the highest, so the affinity of the, in, the enzyme to the substrate was reduced due to the presence of competitive inhibitor. Okay, the second case study, they looked at uh, atmosphere. Um, looking at the argon versus oxygen. So this is a modified atmosphere packaging study. To look at how the presence of different oxy uh, oxygen versus argon will impact the activity of, or the kinetics of the uh, polyphenol oxidase. So again, they ran the kinetics under different conditions. So here in this case, they had air as an atmosphere and similar distribution of oxygen to nitrogen as in air. Usually oxygen is around 19, 20%, and nitrogen is about 78% in air. And you have a little bit of carbon dioxide and a little bit of argon in air. But if you look at air in the 21 to 79, they have very similar Vmax and very similar Km. So they kind of um, imitated the air atmosphere. And then they went from low to high oxygen um, content, and they increased, uh, so low oxygen, high argon, and replaced nitrogen by argon. Same concentration of nitrogen versus argon. So what you can see here is Vmax was not impacted. So what happens here is it seems like it's a competitive inhibition again, and the argon is competing with oxygen. So the oxygen is here the substrate that is being competed against by uh, argon. Because then you look at the Km value, the Km value got higher in the presence of argon. The more argon you have, the higher is your Km value. And they looked at two different enzymes, mushroom and PPO, and the same thing is with the highest argon concentration and the lowest oxygen concentration, you have the highest Km value.
So, enough with PPO. Moving to another oxidoreductase, which is uh, used for different application. One application is in food analysis, especially the quantification of glucose. So you can, if you want to quantify specifically glucose, you can use the glucose oxidase to produce lactone and then in the pred and peroxide, and then the peroxide will oxidize a dye to give you an oxidized dye that has a color, and that would be measured by spectrophotometry. And it's very common, we not only use it as just in to measure glucose, but we use it to measure um, amylose, amylopectin, and starch, total starch, after we hydrolyze it into glucose, and that's the last step. So in analysis, food analysis of carbohydrates, this comes very handy. Another application uh, is used as oxygen scavenger in active or bioactive packaging. So the enzyme, uh, the glucose oxidase, actually immobilize um, on a metal or glass or nylon or cellulose, whatever is the packaging material. And then it's entrapped in a gel and it kind of scavenges uh, the oxygen so to prevent oxidation in the packaging. Other application of immobilized enzymes, can you think of any? Speaking of immobilized enzymes in industry. Okay, no. You can't think of anything that could be using immobilized enzyme? Delactose milk, so that's when you use lactase or, uh, yeah, so using the lactase to, or beta galactosidase enzyme to break the lactose in milk. Okay, what other application? Very common application. Okay. Here are a few high fructose corn syrup where we are using the different enzymes to break the starch and then from starch you get dextrins and then from dextrins you break them into single glucose units and then you use invertase to um, invert or convert glucose to its isomer, not invertase, isomerase. Again, I confuse invertase and isomerase. Invertase is for sucrose. Okay. Um, production of protein hydrolysate. And ELISA is actually uh, commonly used for analytical purposes. So enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, where the enzyme is immobilized or on a, uh, antibody so that you can use that for detection of the presence of antibody that is linked to an antibody. Different enzymes in food systems. So here in baking specifically, amylase is used, uh, is sometimes added to maximize fermentation. So amylase will generate smaller sugars for the yeast to feed on. Uh, proteases, we can add sometimes proteases to break down the gluten network or make it less elastic. Um, on, in other cases, you add the glutamyl uh, transferase or transglutaminase. This means the same thing. That, for, you've seen this before, what it does, it's kind of, um, it's an enzymatic reaction that induces polymerization. And it is between amine group of lysine and the carboxyamide group of glutamine. So in the presence of transglutaminase, they um, form a polymer. This is particularly important if you want to produce gluten-free bread, let's say from rice. They are low in prolamines, and prolamines will learn in cereal proteins later on. They are important for viscoelastic properties of the dough. So rice is low in prolamines, so therefore presence of that enzyme helps in generating um, sort of a good dough for baking without collapsing. Um, okay, 
So enzymes in milk um, and dairy products, or in this case, soy milk, this, this is not dairy. But anyway, enzymes in milk in general, chymosin is used for generation of curds, cheese curds, proteases and lipases during the ripening generation of flavor. Sulfider oxidase is sometimes used to remove cooked flavor and the galactosidase or lactase is used to remove lactose. And this example here, microbial proteases, is used to enhance milk, soybean specifically milk coagulation. Enzymes can be used to remove unwanted constituents. Again, this example of lactose in, for lactose-free milk, catalase to get rid of peroxida, peroxides, and then digestive um, proteases to reduce bitter peptides, and then uh, proteases sometimes are used also to uh, hydrolyze protease inhibitors. In analysis, use enzyme to measure substrates such as measuring sulfides. Declare on the label for people that are sensitive to sulfide. We measure the amount of sulfide present uh, by enzyme, glucose by glucose oxidase, starch, breaking down the starch all the way to glucose and measure glucose by glucose oxidase. And demalic acid is uh, commonly analyzed to determine if the apple juice, for example, has been uh, synthetic or um, or non-synthetic. So in native apple juice, malic acid is the L form, not the D form. So if there is any um, suspicion of non-natural apple juice, so they can measure the presence of the malic acid. And here are some uh, measurements for enzymes. And here the substrate should not be the limiting factor, it should be much more then Km value, where it's first order with respect to the enzyme, zero order with respect to the substrate. Peroxidase and lipoxygenase, either or, can be measured to determine uh, blanching, uh, successful blanching to reduce the enzymes during processing and the activity of enzymes during processing and during storage of food. So after blanching, to determine the success of the blanching, you can either measure peroxidase or lipoxygenase. Also, the measurement of lipoxygenase in, in grains is important to determine the potential of lipid oxidation during storage. Alpha amylase um, is measured in flour to determine whether uh, the susceptibility of starch to breakage, which will result in low viscosity in different applications of starch. So it's an indication of flower quality. And rennet activity is often determined so that you can um, determine how much rennet you need to use for cheese production um, or curd production. These are just a few examples. There are so many other examples. Uh, I probably you have a couple of other slides that I kind of hid because there's no time I need to move on to the other uh, topic. The remaining two slides were just another example or couple of examples for applications. All right, so I'm going to give you five minutes break and then we'll start daily proteins.
have a question on one of the first slides from last lecture. Mm -hmm. There's um, VM and KM. Is VM the same as VMAX here? Yeah, that's VMAX, yeah. Okay. Okay. Everybody back? Is that you? Yeah. Okay. Just making sure there's no other student here. All right. Shifting gears a little bit. So back to this map of the topics of this course. So far, we talked about protein structure in native form and then how it's impacted by intrinsic and extrinsic factors and how that impact functionality. So we covered all of that. Um, but now what we're moving on, what's remaining is looking at differences in protein sources and how the differences in the protein sources impact their functionality. Obviously, there will be differences in their structure and composition, and therefore, how would that impact functionality under different conditions? So that's the next section, is talking about different protein sources. And then after that, the last bit would be protein modification. So we'll move on to our next section and start off with a very common uh, protein, which is milk protein. But before we jump into that, Currently, what is in the, in the market, the most common proteins or protein as food ingredients are your daily proteins or milk proteins. You have, as ingredients, you have the casein proteins, most commonly sodium caseinate and calcium caseinate. We'll talk about how they're produced and their functionality as well. 
um, whey protein concentrate and isolates. So we have, uh, also we're gonna talk about how they're produced as well, their structure, their functionality. And then another common ingredient is soy protein. Uh, obviously, and it's present in three forms. The flour, which is about um, 40 to 50 percent protein, and then soy protein concentrate, which is a, about 60 to 80 percent protein, and then soy protein isolate, which is 90 percent or higher protein. Egg proteins also, you have the albumin, which is mainly the egg white protein, and then the yolk protein as ingredients as well, and then cereal protein, wheat uh, protein is mainly used obviously for baking applications from using flour, sometimes you add vital gluten to enhance the functionality of, of baked products, but also gluten now has been used quite a bit for meat replacement um, applications where a combination of gluten and soy protein is commonly used for imitation of meat products. Um, and of course, you have the meat protein, very common is the gelatin used in many applications for the gelation, and then the myofibril proteins as well. All of these can be found, or most of them can be found as hydrolysates as well. So. Uh, you can find in the market casein hydrolysate, whey protein hydrolysate, soy protein hydrolysate, etc. So these are our common ones, but you have emerging, emerging proteins as well currently in the market. So the pulses, pea protein is becoming quite um, famous right now. Um, and then other pulses are being investigated as other sources of proteins. Um, other oil seeds, canola, sunflower, camarina, pennycrest, insect protein, single cell proteins, algae, fungal, others uh, emerging as well, such as hemp, corn, potato, oats, peanuts, and the list keeps growing. Okay, we'll talk about as much as we can. We don't have that many lectures left unless you want to stay after the final and come every week just to learn about each of these different proteins. Worth a lecture each. Who says yes? <laughs> okay, we're here through the summer. Jason. <laughs> Oh, they're being used in so many applications, the cricket flower. So, yeah, you can use them. Well, one of our capstone groups. Yeah. Huh? What, what did you do? What? Yeah, tell, tell Jason what you did with it. Um, we used like a date bar, or uh, what are they called? Lara, thank you. Lara bar. Um, we made them into balls, and then we dipped them in chocolate and almonds. So it's just a different source of protein, more sustainable source of protein. Um, but they can be used also as meat replacers too, right? Mm -hmm. I've made cookies out of flour before. You yeah, made cookies, yeah. Chips, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah there's there's just mm -hmm. And there's chicken and chicken. Yeah, they're not crunchy. They're not crunchy. They're not crunchy. Yeah, crunchy. They're good. <laughs> like protein bars with cricket protein, right? Also, they're just using this protein for animal food sources. Cows are eating Yeah. Okay. So you're staying in the summer to learn about cricket proteins? Yeah. Why not? Okay. Let's start with the most traditional proteins, milk proteins. So the composition of milk protein in milk is about 3 to 4 percent, depending on the variety of the cows. But it's really low amount of proteins in milk, because most of the milk is what? Water. OK, but in the, within the protein, within this 3, three to 4 percent of protein, 
We have casein proteins and whey proteins. Casein protein represents 80% of that 3 to 4%, and the whey protein represents 20%. And then we have a whole list of enzymes that are naturally present in milk. Quite, quite a few and extensive list of enzymes present in milk, but most common that you probably would hear about, one is problematic, which is the native uh, plasmid system in milk. Um, it's problematic because it can cause a thinning and dilation of milk over time because it, it is very thermally stable and it kind of chews on a mostly beta casein. Um, alkaline phosphatase, it's not necessarily a impact the quality of milk itself, but we use it as an indicator for pasteurization of milk, and we talked about that before. So these are just like two key ones that um, you might hear of more than the others. Okay, so within the casein, we have four different types of casein. We have alpha S1, alpha S2, beta casein, and kappa casein. And within the whey protein, the major ones are alpha lactoglobulin and beta lactoglobulin. As the major components are the main contributor to functionality of whey protein. But we also have in whey serum albumin, lactotransferrin, immunoglobulins. These are minor components of, of the whey protein. So this is kind of the breakdown of milk proteins. Um, so you'll see that the minor proteins and enzymes, and then you have the caseins, alpha, alpha S1, the, the A, B, C, D, and all of these letters are genetic variations that have been identified and also sequenced. Um, and then this is just the amounts of each fraction within a liter of milk. And under beta casein, you'll see that there are the gamma 1, 2, and 3. They, are, they could be naturally present. Um, why? Because beta casein is susceptible to plasmin hydrolysis, and plasmin is naturally present in milk. So it will uh, break down beta casein into the gamma casein and the proteose peptone. That's a good college ball question. What is a proteose peptone? Proteose peptone is the, because beta casein is very amphiphilic, part of it is hydrophobic and the second part of it is hydrophilic. So when the enzyme uh, plasmin cuts, it can cut at different locations and generate those uh, hydrophobic peptides that remain with the casein portion of the milk, and then uh, when we separate whey from casein, sometimes we see proteose peptone, which is the hydrophilic peptide of, that comes off breakage of beta casein using the, from the plasmin that is naturally present in the milk. And of course, you need to memorize all of these small numbers because they will come on the test. <laughs> no, just kidding. Why would I do that? OK, so now. OK, so let's talk about the casein uh, components or protein components. So the alpha S1, alpha S2, and beta casein are all phosphorylated. That means. Uh, Either serine or thionine can be phosphorylated, but in this case, it's the serine residue are phosphorylated, meaning you have a phosphate group attached to your serine group where at the OH group. If you remember from our basic structure, we have serine and thionine has OH groups that can be phosphorylated or glycosylated post-translation. And that is here what happens post-translational modification of the casein protein uh, had the phosphorylation at the serine residues of these proteins, which makes them bind to calcium. 
And that is part of the stabilization of the casein micelle, the ability of the phosphate attached to these proteins allow them to bind to calcium and cross-link within the casein micelle and stabilize that structure. So one of the stabilizing forces of the casein micelle. Beta-casein specifically is the least phosphorylated and most hydrophobic of the casein micelles and we're going to, of the casein protein. We're going to talk more about each one of them separately. Because they're phos these are phosphorylated, they are sensitive to calcium concentration. So that's why in, when you make cheese, sometimes you add calcium, you enhance the precipitation or the curd formation. Because in the presence of more calcium, these casein can precipitate or coagulate. So you add calcium to milk to enhance the curd formation or strengthen the curd formation. Kappa casein is not phosphorylated, it's glycosylated, but at the thionine residue. So alpha S1, alpha S2, and beta are phosphorylated at serine residue. Kappa casein is glycosylated at the thionine residue. So kappa casein, not kappa casein, caseins in general, they have. Um, open structure, and again, if you remember, uh, talking about proline as a secondary structure breaker, it, caseins in general are really high in proline, 17% of the amino acids within the caseins are proline's, and this uh, makes the structure almost a random quill, very minimal secondary and tertiary structure. With that structure that is open up and the caseins have very amphiphilic nature, that means you have pouches of hydrophobic residues and pouches of hydrophilic and charred residue, make the protein very amphiphilic in nature with distinct hydrophobic and hydrophilic clusters or regions. With that, they are called what? Because of this characteristics, they are what? in terms of functionality. Natural, natural emulsifiers. So because of that distinct clusters and the open structure, they are natural emulsifier. They have high surface adsorption. Okay. So alpha S1, Casein, it has seven to eight phosphate groups in the highly negatively charged clusters here. So you have the glutamic acid serine that is phosphorylated, isoleucine with serine phosphorylated, two serines here and two glutamic acids. So it's mostly in this region of the polypeptide chain. And it is it has a net negative charge of negative 20, and the calcium sensitivity is 3 to 0.28 millimolar. Somewhere around here, it becomes very sensitive and it could precipitate due to uh, cross bridges formation. And then it has three region of uh, hydrophobic regions, so anything white is hydrophobic regions, clusters of hydrophobic regions. Okay. Again, emphasizing the apathetic nature of a really highly negatively charged region. And uh, this gray one here is basically polar, not charged. But the white ones are very hydrophobic regions. And these are the locations, so 1 to 40 residue. One, the first amino acid to the 40th amino acid, 81 to 113, and 132 to 199. These are all hydrophobic residues. And then the region here between 41 and 80 is the region that is negatively charged with an average of negative 20.6. 
which is the polar domain. Alpha S2 is the most phosphorylated of all caseins. So it's the most sensitive to um, calcium. That's why it has, it can tolerate the lowest concentration here is two, or the highest concentration it can tolerate is two millimolar. So which is a lower concentration of calcium than alpha S1. Why? Because this has seven to eight phosphate groups, whereas this one has 10 to 13 phosphate units. So that's why it's highly sensitive to, to uh, calcium, and it is more the most hydrophilic of all of the caseins, of all of the four caseins. Alpha S2 is the most hydrophilic. Um, so you can see it has several regions that are negatively charged, but the net negative charge of the entire uh, alpha S2 case is negative 12 to negative 17, depending on the variant or the genetic variant. So it has three anionic clusters, one, two, three, um, and then two main hydrophobic regions here and the, and the carboxyl terminal. So mostly hydrophobic on the carboxyl terminal site. It has one uh, or two cysteine residues that can be um, can form disulfide linkage within the within the molecule itself or across different molecules. So beta casein is the most amphiphilic. Um, or amphipathic. So it has one region, one, the end terminal is charged, negatively charged, net negative 11. And then the carboxyl terminal is hydrophobic. But you can see that the percentage of hydrophobicity is greater than the hydrophobicity. So it's a very hydrophobic um, case. It's sensitive to temperature due to this high hydrophobic uh, percentage. So at low temperature, you, the hydrophobic interactions are reduced, and that's why beta casein can be solubilized into the whey in refrigerated temperature. So it's very, it's very uh, affected by temperature. It has the highest proline content among all of the casein and, and accordingly random structure like the rest of them. And it's very susceptible to plasmid hydrolysis. All of the other caseins are susceptible, but this one is the most susceptible. It has several regions where the plasmin can hydrolyze. Plasmin has a specificity similar to trypsin, so it can uh, break at lysine and arginine locations. So wherever there is lysine, it can uh, break. So there are three specific regions where it can break the peptide bond, and that's why you can have three um, gamma proteins, one, two, and three, because there are three regions. And then the hydrophilic protease peptone that we talked about, and if whey is separated from casein, Hydrophilic proteose peptone will be with the whey fraction of the milk. Kappa casein, it does not have an ionic cluster of phosphate groups. So there is no cluster that is high in phosphorylated groups. Therefore, it's not sensitive to calcium. So it's not impacted by calcium concentration. It's a very amphiphilic. Uh, again, similar to beta casein, our opposite direction. So the beta casein is uh, negatively charged on the M terminus. This one is negatively charged on the carboxyl. Again, so it has one cluster that is hydrophilic, and then the rest of it is hydrophobic. So it's a very, again, amphiphilic. Um, structure. 
It is a glycosylated protein and add the thymine residues. And these are the different uh, carbohydrates that can be uh, glycosylated to the protein. It has a major role in the stability of the casein mice cell, and we'll talk about that later. So this is kind of the summary of it. Um, it would be good to know um, to draw them and know how they are in terms of the distribution of the negatively charged clusters and the hydrophobic uh, clusters. It's not very hard to remember, especially these two beta casein is hydrophilic on the N terminals, kappa casein hydrophilic on the uh, carboxyl. And then alpha S1 has one cluster that is negatively charged somewhere in the middle. And then alpha S2 has three different locations of charges and two locations of hydrophobic regions. So it's, this is kind of a summary of, um, of its characteristics. And the, the number here donate the amino acid residue. So this is, it has 199 amino acid, 207, 209, 169. So they are very similar in molecular weight, really, because of the close uh, amount of amino acids. So Given their characteristics, the presence of phosphorylated groups, the hydrophobicity, the amphiphilic structure, they have a tendency to associate. And they associate as micelles. So a micelle, the general characteristic of a micelle, it's basically 92 to 94% protein, and it has 6 to 8% of milk salts, mostly calcium and some magnesium as well, and obviously the phosphates. Um, the ratio of the four different proteins in a micelle is in this. So 3 to 1 alpha S1 to alpha S2, and then 3 to 1 beta KC to kappa KC. So I'll explain later, but the concentration of beta KC and kappa KC are directly related to the size of the KC in micelle. So if we, if we have more kappa casein, relatively higher amount of kappa casein in milk, the micelles will be smaller. And the opposite is true. If we have higher beta casein concentration, the micelles will be bigger. And I'll explain that in a minute when I show the uh, casein micelle structure. So the casein micelle structure over the years has been, um, been trying to be predicted um, in terms of how the micelle is formed. So the original model, there are several models that have been proposed. The original one is the coat and core model, which is very simple. It basically say that the core of the micelle is mostly alpha and beta. And the surface, the casein lies on the surface. Because the, ca the kappa casein has the uh, glycosylated end that gives the negative charge that allows the stability of the micelle. So two micelles don't come close to each other because of the uh, glycosylated portion of the kappa casein. So this proposed model is that kappa casein are all on the outside, and then the alpha and beta are in the inside. And that, that's the linear relationship between the size of the uh, micelle, or the surface area, and the kappa casein. Because the more kappa casein you have, the more of them will be on the surface, so there will be more of them. Then you will have smaller micelles and larger surface area. The submicelle model is um, it came later on, and what they have found or predicted is that 
you have sub-micelles within the micelle. So you would have a sub-micelle that has a hydrophobic core where um, most of the hydrophobic um, regions of alpha S1, alpha S2, and beta casein is in here. And then on the surface, you have the phosphorylated portions of those proteins. And then um, you have kappa casein on, on the surface of that sub -micelle. And then this is the glycomicropeptide. This should be G, not C. Glycomicropeptide, which is the hairy layer. The glycomicropeptide is the portion of the kappa casein that is hydrophilic and glycosylic. So the, the sub-micelles with the higher concentration of kappa, kappa casein would be located on the surface or form around the surface and um, enclose the sub-micelles that have higher concentration of alpha S1, alpha S2, and uh, beta casein. And then what keeps those together is hydrophobic interaction as well as the calcium phosphate clusters. So you have calcium phosphate bridges, so from the phosphorylated groups and then calcium, they would form um, a cluster and therefore link those submicelles together. So that is the submicelle model, and they kind of done an uh, electromicrograph image, and they predicted wrong, but they predicted that this is your micelle, and those little ones are submicelles. <coughs> but that is not accurate because later on, a more accurate method. Um, oh, but before I move into that, this is kind of a um, illustration of the submicelle model, where it shows the uh, calcium phosphate clusters and your serine residues that are phosphorylated, and then they are linked to the calcium phosphate cluster um, by <coughs> calcium bridges, and these proteins are linked together and stabilized within the submicelle. So this kind of the blue area here, the black area, is what is predicted as the calcium phosphate clusters uh, linked as well as hydrophobic interactions that keep the, keep the caseins in the middle here linked together and what's on the outside is um, you have the kappa casein, glycomicropeptide, and in the inside you have the calcium phosphate bridges. Okay, but the nano cluster model is the most realistic model uh, for the casein myself. And here, um, they don't have submicelles. What they say is they are, um, they form, the caseins form sort of a web with the alpha S1, alpha S2, and beta casein randomly linked within the micelle. They are linked via hydrophobic interaction as well as calcium phosphate bridges. And then most of the kappa caseins lie on the surface with the hairy structure that is negatively charged, allowing a negative charge surrounding the casein in my cell, which gives it its stability. Therefore, in milk, the casein in my cells don't come together and they don't separate. So it is a colloidal system that is very stabilized due to the kappa casein uh, glycomacro peptide around that my cell. So these are all of the different models summarized here. This is taken uh, from this reference. So it shows the progression of the different models and the different illustrations of the models, with the last one by Hope is the most recent and most accepted right now as a model for the casein. And this is an image by uh, the cryotransmission electron microscopy. And these, this here is a micelle. And those dark spots are really the calcium uh, colloidal phosphate. Calcium phosphate clusters are the dark points. Um, 
So it's not really a submicel, it's just your proteins are interacting via calcium phosphate bridges, via hydrophobic interaction with the kappa casein around the surface. This is an animation of the casein micelle with the colors, with the different colors. So the orange represents the alpha S1, S2, and the beta casein. The gray spheres are your calcium phosphate clusters. Um, the beta casein specifically is your blue, which link or attach to the other casein via hydrophobic interactions. And then the other caseins interact via phosphate, calcium phosphate bridges. And then this is your kappa casein on the surface. Most of it is on the surface. The green head is the hydrophobic portion that's interacting via hydrophobic interactions with the other caseins. And the hairy-like structure is your glycomacropeptide, which is negatively charged and stabilizing the KCE in my cell. Any questions on the KCE in my cell? Okay. So stability of the my cell. So first of all, heat stability. So it's a really very stable system. However, at high temperature, you, we, we get um, loss of stability and aggregation. So excessive heating causes coagulation. So first of all, what happens when we heat, we get denaturation of whey protein. So when the protein, whey protein is denatured, it opens up, exposes the free sulfidyl group within. And that free sulfidyl group can bind to a sulfidyl group from kappa casein. And that can cause uh, aggregation of proteins. Another thing that happens with heat is a decrease in pH. The decrease in pH um, is a result of formation of colloidal calcium phosphate. So colloidal calcium phosphate is a big cluster of calcium phosphate. And then when they're formed, when the colloidal calcium phosphate are formed, that means you have less soluble phosphates and less soluble calcium, and they have more release of protons. So you have more release of protons because calcium is now reacting with the phosphate. So when you have release of protons, the pH drops. At high temperature, you get dephosphorylation of casein that result in destabilization as well of the casein myself. Degradation of lactose give you lactic acid that makes the pH drops even more. Kappa casein can be hydrolyzed, and if the glycomycopeptide is hydrolyzed, you lose stability as well. There would be a decrease accordingly in the surface charge of the of the micelle. And then with high temperature, we have increased hydrophobicity or hydrophobic interactions and new colloidal calcium phosphate interaction with, within or across different micelles, not within the one micelle, but between different or among different micelles leading to aggregation. This is kind of the animation of what happens. So with heat, you have higher colloidal calcium phosphate that this destabilizes the calcium and phosphate balance within the micelle itself. And the release of protons result in the decrease of pH. And also the degradation of lactones result in decrease of pH. Hydrolysis of phosphoserine result in decrease in pH. When you have a decrease in pH, the pH starts approaching the isoelectric point of Kc. Then we have lowering the beta potential. That means lowering the surface charge. And with that, you don't have as much repulsion. And, okay, you don't have as much repulsion, so you have irreversible aggregation. And then here, the colloidal calcium phosphate increase leads to new interaction of the micelles via calcium phosphate bridges. Not within the micelle itself, but across different micelles. 
And then the differentiation of whey protein result in better epiglobulin reacting with kappa casein, more aggregation via disulfide linkages. And then uh, with high heat, you have stronger hydrophobic interactions that leads also to aggregation. So it's a very complex uh, set of events, but they all lead to aggregation. This is a visual demonstration of what actually happens. So the impact of lower pH or acid stability of the casein. So as the pH drops and you reach isoelectric point, you get coagulation similar to the formation of yogurt. So the total surface charge is reduced and then casein aggregates with no fusion. That means it's forming a gel, it's not forming a coagulum. There is minimum synergesis. Okay, so back to this animation, it shows you under different conditions what happens to the casein micelle. So in the first A, that's when you have the stability of the micelle. So this is micelle in milk. You have your kappa casein that is inducing surface charge, so there's no interaction, colloidal system that is stable. And then in B, what happens in B is the remit. Uh, micelle or renated micelle, that means pyrimosin has been added, and that hairy like structure, which is a glycomacropeptide, has been cleaned off. So, what is left is the hydrophobic surfaces. So, you have the hydrophobic surfaces, the, the glycomicro, uh, not, not the glycomicropeptide, you have the uh, paracapa casein, which is left here, which is hydrophobic and then the hydrophobic surfaces of the other proteins, and also the colloidal phosphate systems are exposed to each other from two different micelles. And that's when we have fusion and formation of the curd by hydrophobic uh, attractions, as well as um, colloidal system bridging. So colloidal phosphates bridging. Uh, the C is when you acidify the micelle, so you really lose the charge. So here you don't no longer have that negative charge, so really you don't have the pulsion, and the proteins start interacting with each other and coming together to form a three-dimensional you know, gel. And the D, the last one, is um, when beta lactoglobulin is denatured and it is interacting with the um, kappa casein, which, which can cause um, aggregation as well. But if we have denatured beta casein and you're trying to add chymosin enzyme to form the curd, the chymosin might be inhibited or might be kind of static hindrance so that the enzyme cannot reach the location where it cuts off. So that's why the milk intended for cheese making, they don't really heat it to pasteurization temperature because pasteurization temperature of 72 degrees can result in denaturation of beta lactoglobulin and might inhibit the action of the enzyme by just blocking that site over there or generating a hindrance. Storage stability of what happens over time, there's a common phenomenon that is called age gelation. And if you have milk just sitting there, well, the milk has been pasteurized, but the lactoglobulin has been denatured. So over time, there's going to be interaction of whey protein with the casein, eventually forming um, an aggregate and a separation. <coughs> Surface charge will be decreased. Plasmin and prote bacterial proteases start cutting or chopping off at the casein, especially the beta casein, 
which results in thinning of the milk and separation. The bottom layer would be gelled and aggregates, and then the top layer you would see a separated milk over time. Whey proteins. So whey protein, like I said, the main components or the major components of whey protein is alpha lactalbumin or alpha lactalbumin and beta lactoglobulin. And beta lactoglobulin is present in higher concentration than alpha lactalbumin. So these are the main components, so they are responsible for the functionality of whey protein. And whey protein does not exist as a micelle, obviously. Uh, it exists in molecular dispersion. That means it can be a monomer, can be present as a dimer, or can be present as an optomer. So these are the, th the three different molecular dispersions that we can find those proteins in. And it all depends on um, the pH of the system. If the pH is really high or really low, then they exist in monomers. If the pH is close to the isoelectric point, they exist in uh, octomer. And that's what causes kind of turbidity around the, that pH. Um, when they are, um, when the pH is between 5.5 and 7.5, for instance, that is not too high, not too low, not close to the isoelectric point, they exist in dimers. So alpha lactalbumin um, has a lot of alpha helices, um, some random coil, maybe just one portion as beta sheet. And it has eight residues of cysteine, and all of them are involved in SS linkages making the structure really compact. So we have four SS linkages since we have eight cysteines. The beta lactoglobulin is also compact, also stabilized by, with a well-defined secondary structure, and it has a lot of beta sheet and just one uh, alpha helix and some beta turns and some random coil. It has five cysteine residues, so you have two SS linkages and one free sulfide group, which is a very reactive group that it plays a major role in protein polymerization upon denaturation of the protein. So they are both highly structured globular protein. They have minimum flexibility. And Alpha lactalbumin denatures at 63 degrees, so low denaturation temperature. If you remember from what we talked about, the more the protein is structured, the more it is sensitive to heat denaturation. So this is um, a demonstration of that. So it is, it does denature at low temperature. But beta lactoglobulin, while it denatures at low temperature, is a little bit higher because beta sheets are more stable than alpha helix to thermal denaturation. So since it has higher beta sheet percentage, it, uh, it would stand higher temperature before denaturation. So the beta sheet, it represents about 50% of the secondary structure. We talked about the five residues, one short alpha helix. The hydrophobic groups are mostly in the interior, very low surface hydrophobicity. Only one surface hydrophobic pocket, which allows binding of hydrophobic molecules like retinol, for example. But because of the high surface hydrophobicity, that's what gives the protein really high solubility over a wide range of pH that we talked about before, especially when it's not denatured. But when it's denatured, hydrophobic surface is exposed, 
when, they, when there is no net charge anymore, hydrophobic interactions are strong, and then solubility is reduced. We talked about that before. So beta lactoglobulin, like I said, denatures at 73. It can interact with capatacein, um, causing ACE gelation over time as well as impacting the hydrolysis with chymosin or rennet during cheese making. That's why they heat the milk probably to 60 degrees rather than uh, 70 degrees or 72 degrees for pasteurization. So it's pH dependent, sensitive around pH 4, which is uh, its isoelectric point, maximum stability at pH 6, Stability decreases at higher pH. So, and this is what we talked about in terms of monomer, the pH when it's monomer, pH when it's dimer, optimer, and then above, like at high pH, then we get uh, expanded monomer, which is irreversible denaturation. Alpha lactalbumin, it has mostly helixes, so four uh, alpha helixes and one antiparallel beta sheet. We talked about eight residues of uh, cysteine, which makes it four cysteines, that means double uh, disulfide linkages, four disulfide linkages. Compact. It's a calcium metalloprotein, that means it has tendency to bind calcium. So in the presence of calcium, it really more heat stable because it binds calcium within its moiety. And um, if you deplete the calcium, it becomes more susceptible to thermal denaturation. It is involved in calcium synthesis as an enzyme regulator. So it is more heat sensitive than beta lactoglobulin and that because of it is of its alpha helix versus beta sheet. Um, and it does have reversible thermal denaturation around 63. And like I said, when you lose bound calcium at low pH, it becomes more, even more heat sensitive. This is a really cool table um, to look at and study the difference between whey protein and casein in terms of molecular weight, uh, number of amino acid residues, number of hydrophobic residues, um, iso isoelectric point, number of proline residue, lysine residue. It's kind of an overview comparison between whey and casein. It's really good. Uh, table to look at, not necessarily memorize the numbers, but look at differences between the two types of proteins within milk. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop here, but next time, look at this table. We're going to look at comparison of casein to whey under these different characteristics. So I hope your uh, PowerPoint slides don't have the answers. Okay, so if you like, or if not if you like, take a moment to fill out this table for discussion next time. Okay, we'll end here.